But when you look at what Francis is potentially going to do in 2024, what do you think are the right moves, the right opponents, uh, whether it be in boxing or in the PFL smart cage? Well, I'm seeing some rumors that maybe he and Chisora are going to box, maybe even before the year is out. That That's interesting, right? That gives us a, a better sense of what we saw against Tyson Fury was kind of a flash in the pan, or if it's something that he can really truly contend with and beat the, uh, the top level heavyweight boxers in the world. And I think the answer to that question is probably yes. And welcome back to a brand new episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. My guest this week is the former PFL light heavyweight champion turned broadcaster. He is the the play-by-play commentator for the PFL, smart cage interviewer. He is the brand ambassador. He is Mr. PFL, in my opinion. It is Sean O'Connell. Sean, how you doing, my man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It's been a while since we've had a chance to talk. Yeah, I know. So just full disclosure, I obviously worked at the PFL back in 2018 slash 2019. And it was a pleasure to work with you uh, behind the scenes, uh, a part of the social media team. And so much has happened since. And there's so much to talk about. I think maybe we should just start with the PFL in general. Before we kind of get into your journey as a broadcaster, what an incredible year for the PFL in terms of just announcements, leveling up as a promotion. And I would just love to get get your take in terms of 2023 as a capsule moment moment for the PFL what has it been like to be a part of the organization as it has leveled up this year you know it's been really cool to uh to kind of watch it unfold and to realize you know when you step back like man I'm part of something that's growing very fast and I think that's growing in a, in a significant way and and making strides that probably usually take companies in any industry but especially in our sports entertainment industry probably take uh, twice as long, right? We're only in our fifth year and we're already uh, pulling in big big ratings. We're pulling in big fighters. Obviously, they've uh, made some overtures and some signings and, and some creative decisions that have made a splash in the MMA world. And I'm really proud to be associated with the company. And I think that the future is incredibly bright. So it, it's exciting. Yeah, I'd love to kind of just cherry pick a few of these massive announcements. I think the, the first one earlier this year was just Jake Paul being involved. I mean, talk about a social media superstar, uh, combat sports athlete that kind of moves the needle to a certain demographic and an audience out there. Him being involved, you know, in the PFL, both as an investor and hopefully down the road um, as, a, as a future fighter, you know, how did you kind of take in that news? And what's your experience been like um, with Jake, if you've had any interactions with him so far? I've only had a couple of uh, remote conversations with Jake um, at this point. So, don't really get to speak to what he's like as a person necessarily, but he's he's brilliant at marketing himself. He's brilliant at marketing all the things that he's involved in. And he's done an incredible job of not only selling his fights, but then performing at a level that I think a lot of people either didn't want him to be able to perform at or didn't expect that he would be able to perform at, right? Like he's he clearly takes the combat sports things very, very seriously. I think he's a natural athlete. You know, he's a, he's obviously a big, strong, young kid. And when he has the kind of resources that he's got and he can pull in, you know, training partners, high quality coaches, things like that, get his nutrition and all that stuff dialed in. Like what you're seeing is uh, an accelerated timeline on a guy who just decided what three, four years ago that he wanted to be a, a combat sports athlete after already becoming rich and famous in another world. And I have a ton of respect for that. Right. Because there are plenty of people in this sport who do it because it's what speaks to them, but also because they don't know what else they would do. Right. They don't know how else they would make money. They don't know how else they would feed their families. And Jake Paul doesn't have to worry about those things. So he decided to choose like the most challenging and dangerous sport to get into. Like, I admire that when you don't have to do this and you do it anyway. It's because you really love it. Yeah, I mean, the boxing journey has been incredible to watch, but I'm really interested about this involvement with the PFL because it sounds as though at some point in 2024, 
That's the, that's the indication anyway. He will be making his MMA debut in the PFL Smart Cage. Does that get you excited? And and if we could just perhaps hypothesize potential opponents, like is there someone that perhaps comes to mind? Like like for me, as, as a complete outsider, I look at someone like a Dylan Dennis, right? He just fought his brother, Logan Paul, in boxing. He's out there right now as a free agent. I mean... Jake Paul and Dylan Dennis in the PFL Smart Cage. I mean, that would move the needle, but that's just my opinion. What are your thoughts? I love the matchup, um, but I don't want to have to deal with Dylan Dennis at all, right? Like, <laughs> that's, the only, that's the only thing that I don't love about that idea. No, that, that's the tough part with uh, with Jake Paul. He's, he's too big of a draw. He's too famous. He's too big of a deal for you to put him against another – O and O mixed martial artist or somebody who's not already a known name in the space. I I do love the idea of him rematching Nate Diaz inside of mixed martial arts because he, Nate accounted well for himself, but obviously didn't take the boxing match all that seriously. His legacy is not attached to boxing. In a mixed martial arts fight, he has to take it seriously because that's what he is. That's who he is, right? And for Jake Paul, I, I mean. I like what the guy has done for combat sports and I have no reason to dislike the guy, but I do want to see someone like welcome him in a way that like, Hey, this is a sport that you can't just decide you're going to do pick up and automatically be world-class, right? Nate Diaz is a world-class mixed martial artist and as athletic and talented as Jake Paul is, I don't think he would have a shot really against Nate Diaz. And I don't mind seeing the world, um, <clears throat> or, or having the world be like reminded of that. Like there are levels to everything and boxing is challenging and the influencer boxing scene is great, but it doesn't mean that you're a world-class mixed martial artist just because you had some success there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the beauty about where we are in the fight game right now is there's so many opportunities. I feel like there's more and more free agents popping up all the time, which kind of leads to speculation about what could happen. Uh, so it's definitely a massive story to kind of keep an eye on heading into 2024. So Jake Paul was the kind of the first major announcement for me anyway, that kind of moved the needle for the PFL. But the big one was Francis Ngannou. And he has just turned into the combat sports story of the year. Um, I would just love to kind of get your perspective on First of all, just what it, what it meant to you and the PFL to sign him, but then to go and see what he did against Tyson Fury now as an ambassador for not just mixed martial arts, but the PFL in the squared circle. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I was really excited when the PFL signed Francis because I'm a fan of Francis. I'm a fan of everything about the guy, the way he carries himself. Obviously, a huge admirer of his backstory. I fought on the same UFC card as Francis when he was early in his career. And uh, I was just, you know, I got to meet him there. And he's just, I think he's a very special person. And the fact that now he's associated with a brand and a company that I am part of is exciting to me. I was as skeptical as anyone else that he was going to be able to do what he did against Tyson Fury, right? Because Francis, as a mixed martial arts striker, was never like super clean as a boxer. He had an incredible explosive power and was overwhelming with his physicality, but it wasn't even necessarily a technique thing with Francis, right? And now you're taking this ultimate test against one of the great heavyweight boxers, not just now, but of all time potentially. And you've got to do that on a year's notice, like like to focus for a year on, on just boxing. So I was as skeptical as anyone else that it was like a real legit boxing test and then francis did what he's done for his entire life he proved that you should not expect from him the same things you expect from everyone else right he went out there took the fight a boxing match not just a fight not just a puncher's chance he took that to tyson fury and on my scorecards he won but uh, in any case he won the night even though Technically, it goes down. He's 0-1 as a professional boxer. He won the night. He won the month. He won the year. And I want to remind people that that special moment we got as combat sports fans, as combat sports athletes, as mixed martial arts fans who are also boxing fans, we only got that because the PFL thinks outside of the box and because the PFL does things that the more firmly established UFC refuses to do, right? Right. The reason Francis came over to the PFL 
was largely based on the fact that the PFL was going to allow him to do this. And it wasn't like, well, we only have to think about our bottom line and we only have to think it. It was about, this is a special athlete we want to partner with. And what whatever that looks like, we're going to get creative and make that work. And this is what we got. This is what the PFL got. Certainly, I think the PFL benefits from this, but so do fight fans in boxing and in mixed martial arts. That's because of the vision of the PFL. I don't want people to forget that. Yeah, you're absolutely bang on the money there. And I know Don Davis has done some interviews recently kind of echoing that fact. And it wasn't just the opportunity to box. It was the involvement, you know, in, with PFL Africa, uh, obviously being able to fight uh, in MMA at some point next year. It was the overall package. And, you know, again, this kind of ties into why this has become the combat sports story of the year. Um Again, much like Jake Paul, it's so much fun now to speculate with Francis, right? In terms of what he does next. And we've got an idea that he will fight in the PFL Smart Cage at some point in 2024. And his opponent is going to get a guaranteed purse of $2 million, which is awesome, right? Um, and maybe he gets a boxing match or two prior to that. But when you look at what Francis is potentially going to do in 2024, what do you think are the right moves, the right opponents, uh, whether it be in boxing or in the PFL Smart Cage? Well, I'm seeing some rumors that maybe he and Chisora are going to box, maybe even before the year is out. That That's interesting, right? That gives us a, a better sense of what we saw against Tyson Fury was kind of a flash in the pan, or if it's something that he can really truly contend with and beat the, uh, the top-level heavyweight boxers in the world. And I think the answer to that question is probably yes. And then when you get back to the the smart cage right if it's possible and i don't think that it is but if it's possible to get a steep amiacic who hasn't been happy with the ufc for a long time uh and obviously just had that fight with john jones drop off the map for him if it's possible to get him over for a matchup in the smart cage i think that's something that steep would be open to i think that's something that francis would be open to obviously in the pfl uh, it would be a big win for us to get, you know, two UFC heavyweight champions, two of the great heavyweights in UFC history fighting, fighting in the smart cage and Francis's debut, perhaps. I also love the idea, and this is more outside of the box, and I know not a lot of MMA fans are as enthusiastic about it, but Deontay Wilder has expressed very serious interest and allegedly has been training in mixed martial arts, right? And we're we're not overly accepting of the idea that, a boxer should come over and try what Francis just did in boxing, that they should try that in mixed martial arts. Why not? Right. I mean, Deontay Wilder has proved to us time and time again, he's an elite world-class athlete. He's huge. He's a great puncher. So let's see what he can do in mixed martial arts. And I get it. It's not like a legacy defining type opportunity for Francis as an MMA fighter, but this is about the sports entertainment aspect. Francis is not part of the PFL season. He's not jumping in to the heavyweight tournament or whatever, right? He is fighting in showcase bouts that are going to draw pay-per-view numbers that we all want to see, that spark the curiosity of casuals, that spark the curiosity of hardcore fans in both boxing and mixed martial arts, the things that we want to see, like we all wanted to see in Ganu versus Fury in the boxing ring. So something like that interests me, maybe a lot more than it does other people, but I would love to see it. No, you're absolutely right. And, you know, Deontay Wilder hasn't been shying away from this. You know, he's putting it out there on social media, what it would be like for him to put on four ounce gloves. And that's, again, uh, another pers- possibility for Francis. It's just, this guy's got so many options. It's, it must be good to be in the Francis Ngannou business yeah. right now. Um, so Jake Paul, Francis Ngannou, and the other big thing um, from my perspective with regards to the PFL was the launch of PFL Europe, bringing in Dan Hardy as the matchmaker. I know you've been working with Dan Hardy uh, both on the broadcast with some uh, content for DAZN MMA, but also just in general behind the scenes massive and you know when you think about some of the talent that you guys have acquired in pfl europe cedric dumbe you know jumps to mind i mean he made an incredible debut um what's it been like again for if you can speak to the pfl europe aspect of 2023 for the promotion you know i'll be honest i didn't know fully what to expect from pfl europe because there's a there's a fully realized and fleshed out regional scene in Europe that has already been feeding talent into the PFL and has already been feeding talent into the UFC and into some of the other big organizations around the world. And when the PFL announced that they were going to launch like a vertical over there and they were going to do a regional league in Europe, I, I 
I wondered what kind of fighters we were going to be able to get. I, I wondered if you were going to be able to create that that opportunity for guys who were ready and women, I should say, that were ready to make the leap, but hadn't already made the leap. Like I didn't know what the talent pool was going to be like. And then you talk to somebody like Dan Hardy, and he just says, "Just watch, just wait, just wait until you see this guy." You don't have an understanding of what Dakota Ditchova is really going to be capable of in this sport. I promise you somebody like Cedric Dumbay as a showman and as a fighter is something that everyone's going to want to see. And PFL Europe has delivered in ways that I don't think even the most optimistic outlook could have expected. It's been absolutely incredible. The event in Paris was our best ever event. Global season, PFL Europe, doesn't matter. It was the best event we've ever had in terms of fan response, in terms of VIPs showing up, a true sold-out arena. Um, I don't know about ratings, but like, just because I haven't seen those numbers, but the energy in that building was unmatched. And and I'm, I'm a bat and ball sports guy, as you know. I love all sports. I mean, the, the energy in that arena and the mastery that Cedric Dumbay had over that crowd as he walked out for the main event is something I have never seen in any sport having fought in the UFC, having been to great UFC events, having fought on a Conor McGregor card in Boston. Like Cedric Dumbe did something that I've never seen anyone do outside of the WWE. He has an interaction with his fans as he's walking to the cage. The whole arena knows what he's going to say and how they should respond. It's like this little like ritual going back and forth. No show person, no man or woman in the UFC in combat sports that I've ever seen has done that. I mean, Mike Tyson didn't have a little on cue thing when he was walking out. It was absolutely incredible. So I'm as excited about PFL Europe as I am about the PFL global season. And I thought when this thing was launched, I was like, okay, this is going to be kind of like AAA baseball trying to get your way into the major leagues. Not at all. This is an unbelievable league by itself, whose winners get big cash opportunities, but also probably invitations to compete for a million dollars in our PFL global season. Yeah, that that Dumbay Paris show was just phenomenal uh, to, to take in. And classic hometown hero booking, that's what you do. And it's great to have some of these pieces now. Like when Jake makes his PFL debut, you know you're going to get a big crowd. When Francis makes his PFL, you know it's going to be a big crowd. And just like Cedric Dumbay, and once you have a few pieces like that, it makes for electric atmospheres. Uh, but also with PFL Europe, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, Sean, it means you've been on the road a lot this year. You know, in terms of comparing it to previous years working for the PFL, the number of events, what's it just been like to kind of be on the road and, and kind of carry on a much more um, heavier workload for the, for the organization this year? Yeah, we had Challenger Series, which was in Orlando for eight straight weeks and then went right from there into the first uh, regular season fights, right? And then we had PFL Europe kind of spaced out in between. So, I mean, it was it was 12 events beyond just what the regular PFL season is. Uh, and I've loved it. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't overstate how passionate I am about not only doing this job, but trying to become the best in the world at this job. It's It's the thing that scratches the itch that created by me not fighting anymore i guess you know I, I want to be the best in the world at this and it's obviously a very different challenge and um but i love it and i know that with that comes a workload and comes the need for a lot of reps and i i don't think i was even the first choice for the pfl to do the the europe cards right i think they wanted to get someone local i don't think they wanted to get someone european you know and um i was like no you gotta let me do those because I need to keep doing this and I want to be as involved as possible with everything that the PFL is doing, like all of it. I mean, from day-to-day -day operations to calling these events, I love it. Uh, so it's been obviously a challenge. I've got young children and a lovely wife at home who doesn't always enjoy the fact that I'm on the road, but uh, more than worth it and something that I, I hope continues to grow. And I hope I'm, I get to be a part of every show that the PFL ever does because I really believe in what the company is doing. And uh, the execution has outpaced even my expectations as an insider. Yeah, I love just seeing fighters being able to a, stay within the sport, but more importantly, carve out a legitimate post-fight career where they are enjoying their work, whatever they may do. Um, 
you've been at this now for about five, six years. In terms of the commentary, in terms of the in-cage interviews, the analysis work, previews and breakdowns, how would you assess yourself over this kind of like five-year journey compared to obviously as a mixed martial artist, you were at it for a long time, you know, you can just point to a PFL championship, say, I, I did that, right? But in yeah. terms of this gig, how do you assess yourself and where, you are, where you're at? I mean, look, I think I'm good at it. I'm not going to pretend that I, I think I'm already one of the best in the world. But if you're doing this for one of the big organizations, you better be, right? Because there's in this job, there's, there's how many like top flight play-by-play -play guys that are specific to MMA? There's like 10 total on the planet, right? And I don't want to be number 10. I want to be number one. I'll do respect to everyone else. And I think right now, obviously, John Anik is the gold standard. I want to be better than him. You know, and I'm not there yet. Uh, I think for myself, I need to do a better job of sometimes letting the fight tell the story instead of my voice being there. Right. Sometimes you got to let the moment breathe in television sports. And I come from a sports radio background where you always have to fill the space. That's not true in television. Sometimes you got to just let what you're seeing be the story. Right. Let the moment of the knockout and the crowd's reaction to it be the thing. And that's something that I need to get better at. Uh, I need to give more space, probably, to voices like Kenny Florian and Randy Couture and Dan Hardy and Stefan Struve and all these like great people that I work with. Um, and I probably have to get better at not being so emotionally like fighter centric when I'm in when I get the chance to do cage uh, in in cage interviews, right? I'm so because I I know how you're feeling in that moment, and I always want to know. Tell me what you feel. Like, I probably need to ask more analytical questions. Things about like, how'd you land that right hand? How'd you get that setup going? You know. But I want to know how people feel because I was in those moments. That's all it was for me is that feeling, and the feeling is the special part of it that maybe fighters don't even need to share with the rest of the world, right? Like maybe they don't want to talk about how they feel or why there's tears in their eyes or why they're so proud of themselves. So I could probably get more analytic in those questions, but you know, I'm getting reps and I think I'm always getting better and I'm always working to improve. And I, I really enjoy the work. You know, if my job is to watch a bunch of fights to prepare me to speak more knowledgeably while I'm watching another fight live, that's a pretty good gig. Well, in my opinion, I think you're doing a fantastic job. Play by play is, I think, way hard. Not that I've done either, but like, in my opinion, play by play is way harder than being a color commentator because you're obviously leaning on two people there, Randy and Kenny, to throw to, but you are the main guy. Um, the PFL Championship coming up November 24th in Washington, D.C. How would you assess the overall PFL season this year compared to, to previous years and, and previous championships? Uh, I, I love the season that has developed because we've had some unexpected things happen. And for me, that's great. I like the fact that we have Jesus Pinedo in a championship against Gabriel Braga. I mean, two guys that are still in their 20s and began this year either on our Challenger Series or just complete unknowns coming out of nowhere. Now they're fighting for a million dollars in a championship. And these guys both come from places where that is like, it's actually life changing. I mean, it's it's life changing no matter where you come from, but it's highlighted when you're talking about a fighter from the Peruvian MMA scene that hasn't produced like a ton of worldwide talent yet. You know what I mean? And Gabriel Braga is continuing like a family legacy here and is still undefeated and has an opportunity to really burst onto the world stage with a million dollar championship here. I love that. That's not nobody in the PFL or outside of the PFL had them penciled in at the beginning of the year even when they fought each other in the regular season, because they're both these high level guys and we didn't have context for it. Right. Like they fought a great fight back and forth, but because you're lesser known commodities, it's like, okay, well that was a split decision victory over another unknown. So how dominant is this guy really? Well, he happened to be fighting a world-class fighter and that's why it looked that way. So I'm really excited about a matchup like that. And then obviously the more established fighters, um, you've got Olivia Alban Messier, who's still, undefeated in the smart cage and he's taking on clay collard who for my money is the most exciting fighter on the planet right now he delivers every time he's out there right and it's a huge opportunity for clay the human interest piece there people like 
if folks haven't paid attention to what's happened with Clay in his personal life, he's dealt with so much pain and so much tragedy. You just have to root for something good to happen for the guy. So we've got it all, right? These these beautiful storylines going into it and great fights that I think, you know, on Black Friday, we're going to have some unbelievable bouts. Well, he's such a pro. You've already set up two amazing fights on that card. And and I actually want to just cherry pick a few fights that you haven't mentioned, but I'm personally interested in. And for me, the fight I'm most looking forward to, Sean, is Impa Kasanganai versus Josh Silvera. Impa Kasanganai, I feel like he wins. It's a lock. Comeback of the year. When you look back at where, what this guy, where this guy was at just October of 2020 on the receiving end of a highlight reel knockout at the hands of Joaquin Buckley that Kanye West is posting, one of the most viral knockouts in MMA history. He's on the on the verge of winning a million dollars and I can, I'm pretty damn certain that Joaquin Buckley is not fighting for a million dollars in his next fight. And his opponent, Josh Silvera, is the son of Conan Silvera, the founder, owner of American Top Team, MMA legend. What a great story that is. What's it been like following both these guys' journeys? Because they're both in the PFL Challenger series too. Yeah. Um, I love this fight. Light heavyweight, obviously my weight class there. It's always like something I pay close attention to. I love this fight because whoever wins it's the culmination of a great story, but I also hate this fight because these are two incredible people. Like the, both of these guys away from the cage behind the scenes are as uh, personable, intelligent, respectful as you could possibly be. Like they're, they're both just really well-rounded, cool individuals. Right. So you want great things for both of them. And obviously only one of them gets to be the champion and realize the dream. But the beauty of the PFL format is, even if you lose this year, you hit the reset button and four months from now you start another season. And that's something that we're so familiar with in football and American football and basketball and everything, baseball that doesn't exist in combat sports very often where you just start a new season and you didn't win the Super Bowl this year, but next year you all start at, at the same point. So back to the Silvera and Kasanganai matchup, right? Like Josh is as polished as you can be for someone who has never fought um, in the main limelight for 10 years. You know what I mean? Like he was on the challenger series a couple seasons ago, but he grew up in the gym. He's a guy whose dad is a legendary coach in the game. and was a great fighter himself. So he's a, you know, the, the, the realization of the American dream and the American combat sports dream. And Josh is a step away from winning a championship uh, and Impa, obviously, you know, we do this thing in combat sports where when you see someone get knocked out the way that he got knocked out, or when you see someone maybe go on a bit of a losing streak and they get cut from whatever your favorite organization is, or they experience this low in their career, like the disdain that the organization has somehow transfers over to the fan base. And we like, oh, that guy's washed. Oh, that guy's done. Oh, that guy wasn't that good in the first place. And it's most of the time, it's just not true, right? Like, you have to be not only incredibly skilled, tough, talented to win at this level, but you have to get a little bit lucky. And for Impa, he got a little unlucky in a couple of fights, and it put him on the wrong end of a highlight reel. And credit to Buckley for pulling off that technique. It was unbelievable. Sometimes you just run up against that, and you can't stand up to it, no matter who you are. Now here he is. He had to go back to the drawing board. And he centered himself and he worked his way to a point where his ego was totally removed from the situation, if he ever had one in the first place. And he just put in the work and now he's on the verge of a million dollar championship. And again, he's a young fighter. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility that he could be in this position for two, three, four more seasons. I love the matchup. I love both of these guys. That fight is going to be fantastic. Yeah, I, I literally cannot wait for this one. I, I'm just absolutely buzzing to see how this one plays out. Uh, and you kind of mentioned there how when you're a, a young fighter in the PFL and you stay with the organization, you could potentially rack up multiple championships and multiple million dollar checks. And that's a great segue to the other fight that I'm really looking forward to. And that's Larissa Pacheco versus Moktak Nina. And Pacheco, literally a year ago, pulls off 
I don't know if you want to call it an upset, but it was a very, you know, one-sided dominant fight and performance against Kayla Harrison, in my opinion. And Kayla was obviously the golden girl of the PFL and she's gone on her own journey since that loss. But here's Pacheco going potentially back to back. And if she wins and things go well for Kayla Harrison, then all of a sudden the PFL can promote a two-time PFL champion versus a two-time PFL champion in 2024. Can you just speak to Pacheco's journey this year and her evolution as a mixed martial arts at PFL? Yeah, uh, Larissa Pacheco, she, she won it at 155 pounds and she's back at 145 pounds. We've never had a fighter win it in two different weight classes before, so she could make uh, some history there. Uh, look, she's another example of why you just have to stick with it in this sport. You know, she fought Kayla Harrison twice and had the same result twice. And a lot of people, when that happens, you, you get discouraged and you feel like, oh, my gosh, there's this insurmountable challenge in front of me. What am I what am I even doing here? It, it would have made sense if Larissa Pacheco said, all right, as long as Kayla's there, I don't want to be fighting in the PFL because she's an obstacle to a championship. And she could have gone somewhere else. But what did she do instead? She went back to the drawing board. She went and said, I need to make some changes. She transferred her camp. She got some new coaches involved. Uh, she took some time away from her family, which was sometimes distracting for her. And she committed for a full year to living and training in the United States and got with Jukau and some of those folks. And she just improved herself and then toppled one of the best female fighters in the world in Kayla Harrison and now sets up this potential opportunity for herself. She's a huge favorite in the fight, justifiably so. Going against Marina Mohnakina, I don't think there's a woman on planet Earth right now who hits harder than Larissa Pacheco. I think that when you're talking about her place among the true greats, like she with a win here can put herself in the same conversation that Amanda Nunes and Chris Cyborg and Kayla and Ronda Rousey and uh, you know Jay Chick and and Valentina Shevchenko. I mean, she belongs in that conversation already. She has to prove it with a win here. And then, yes, what that sets up with a potential, I guess, what would that be? Their fourth fight with Kayla Harrison and Larissa Pacheco, both carrying, you know, in the two belts in effectively. Like, I love it. And Larissa is an absolute monster. Tell me what woman on planet Earth right now, Sandu, you would say that girl will definitely beat Larissa Pacheco. No, I mean, of the available featherweights, it'll, at, the, at the absolute worst, it's going to be com very, very competitive. She is right. that damn good. And the, the track record speaks for itself. Um, and you, know, you, you mentioned Kayla there. And, you know, with all the, the PFL championship finals, like the story never gets old right? Like seeing a fighter win a million dollars, life-changing money, getting that belt. It's, a, it's, a, it's why it's the best event of the year in the PFL calendar, right? Because so many stories, you know, play out and, you know, like I said, life-changing money. With Kayla, I feel like this year it's been almost like, all right, I've got to now figure some things out because of the result against Pacheco last year. And it's kind of great that I'm speaking to you right now, just, you know, a, a few days removed from some breaking news where Kayla Harrison's opponent, Julia Budd, is no more. Aspen Ladd is now in. So it's a short notice replacement. And, and that's a fight I'm interested in because, like, I want to see if Kayla has leveled up. Could you commit, perhaps speak to this particular fight and the 2023 journey for Kayla Harrison? Yeah, it's been a weird year, I think, for Kayla. This is someone who is not accustomed to failure, right? And losing against Larissa when she was a favorite going into that fight was perceived by the MMA world and probably by Kayla herself as a, a failure of significant order, right? So then she had to go and, and reevaluate. And, you know, she's a different person now since um since adopting her children and she's got different priorities now and lives the farm life and uh, i think probably has enough money that she can reevaluate how seriously she needs to be involved in combat sports on, on a competitive level in order to like actually provide for her her lifestyle but she's the ultimate competitor right she's a two-time olympic gold medalist and uh i think that what we're going to see and what we have seen over this year was away from the limelight, away from the spotlight, Kayla Harrison fully committed to improvement of her, of herself, of her family situation, of her combat sports abilities, somehow of her fitness level that, which was never in question. Right. Like I think 
it's cliche to say, but I think we're going to see the best version of Kayla Harrison that we've ever seen when she takes on uh, Aspen Ladd. And it would have been the same if she were fighting Julia Budd because she is just a Terminator in that way. She's a machine. I mean, you could put put whoever you want in front of her and Kayla's going to show up with the same focus, especially after going through what she's gone through, having experienced one of the only significant losses in recent memory in her athletic career, right? Like it refocused her and uh, made her, in my mind, incredibly dangerous. So uh, Aspen Ladd, great fighter, tough fighter, obviously someone who at one point was, you know, people were looking at her, is she the next big thing in women's mixed martial arts? Um, And she's had mixed success so far in the smart cage. It is short notice for her, but she was always training to be the alternate. So she's been in a camp. Um, But I mean, now that's the biggest test of her career. It it doesn't get any easier for, for Aspen Ladd because you've got a hungry Kayla Harrison, which is something that, (laughs) that even scares me. So good luck. PFL Championship, November 24th, Washington, D.C. I think there's something for everyone, whether it's stories, marquee fights, marquee fighters, uh, Black Friday, like you said. So it's an easy date for everyone to remember. No competition out there, I don't think, in the combat sports world. So if you're a combat sports fan, this is the event to tune into. Uh, Sean, I'd like to uh, end on this note. You have been with the PFL as a fighter and a broadcaster essentially from day one and with Bellator essentially uh, on the cusp of folding um, and when you think about the MMA landscape perceptually right it feels like PFL is a clear number two like a dominant number two in my opinion right now but could you just speak to perceptually how you feel as though the PFL as a company as a brand as a promotion has changed and leveled up over the last five or six years well, first of all, it's, it's great for me to hear somebody else say that, right? Because in the building, you know, we say that we're, we want to be the clear number two. We want to put space between ourselves and everybody else. And eventually we can turn the focus to chasing that number one spot. But first you got to, you know, you got to crawl before you you walk. And so first you got to get that, that number two spot locked up. And I feel like we're already there. I feel like our distribution, I feel like our sponsorships, I feel like our our broadcast product, I feel like our fighters are all evidence to the fact that we are as good or better than anyone. Uh, Obviously, the UFC is the king and they deserve to be because they've been around for 30 years. Um, But it's good to hear somebody else say that we're a clear number two. I, I just it's so hard for me to ever ignore the idea that on the business side of things, Somehow, Don Davis, Pete Murray, everyone else in their support roles got ESPN to buy into this thing in its second season, right? Not five years after it was an established product, not 10 years after it was an established product, not after it had the PFL had had to foot the bill and pay for itself on like a streaming service or on a spike TV type thing. Like, In year two, ESPN was bought in and said, yeah, we want you on our airwaves alongside the UFC and alongside all the other worldwide leaders in sports. And that's really something, right? Um, And then, of course, you had to have the product and the fights and the fighters to support that, to reward that confidence. And I think the PFL has done that. You know, I think the matchmaking has been good. I think that Ray Seffo and, and the talent team have brought in really good fighters. We've talked earlier in this conversation about the big splashes thinking outside the box a little bit. And it's just a testament to the creativity of the minds at the top of this company. And it gives me incredible confidence that if we can do what we have already done in five years, that 10 or 15 years from now, why shouldn't fans believe that we will be either standing toe to toe or shoulder to shoulder or looking back at the UFC? It wasn't that long ago in mixed martial arts that pride fighting was the legit organization, was where the best fighters were, right? And then what happened? Dana White and Zufa and company took over the space because they made bold moves and they did things that hadn't been done before. Well, now the PFL is doing those things. And I think there's enough room for both companies to exist and to thrive. But if not... You're damn right. We're going to be chasing them hard and hopefully someday overcoming them. Well, the good thing about the situation is the competition in a marketplace like this. Competition 
uh, has to force everyone to level up their game. And I mentioned Bellator, you know, on the cusp of folding. It's actually a shame that they are folding, but it is what it is, unfortunately. Uh, but for organizations like the PFL or One Championship, even the UFC, local promotions, it's just good for everyone involved, for fighters, for people that work in the industry. Um, and it's just honestly just nice to see that a company that I, you know, spent a year of my life working for ha is still around, but not just around, but thriving uh, at such a high level and competing and pushing. And, and, I, and I don't say that PFL is the number two organization just because I have some sort of affiliation and I might have some friends working there. I just honestly mean that. Um, and I feel like that's now going to become the general consensus as we head into 2024. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think obviously the uh, the demise of Bellator contributes to that. But even that um, ends up in the end, I think, being a positive thing because Bellator has got some unbelievable talent on its roster. And, and that talent has been buried uh, in hard to find places. Right. And they've been been buried in the distribution deal that makes it you know less convenient for people to watch. And those great talents, the the Antonio McKees and the Nemkovs and people like that, they're, they're going to be easier for you to find and to watch and hopefully against uh, great competition in the PFL is what I think is going to happen there, right? And if someone falls off and, you know, ends up uh, out of contract and is a free agent that gets picked up by the UFC, awesome. We get to see more great fights and, and those fighters hopefully getting – paydays and exposure that they deserve. Um, I, I love working for the organization and I I do love to, you know, consider the business side of things, but I'm a former fighter. So I always just want the competition to breed better opportunities for fighters. And that's what has happened year over year uh, in this space. You know, Francis Ngannou got a bunch of money. Anthony Pettis got a bunch of money. Um, and, you know, Larissa Pacheco is getting a bunch of money and do for probably even more if she can win another championship aside from her million dollar purse. So the more competition you can have, the more pressure it puts on all of these organizations to compensate fighters fairly. And that's something that this sport, that, that that's really the next step in making this sport truly mainstream because uh, people won't have to have side jobs and people won't have to be doing other things and pursuing other opportunities. They'll get to focus on being combat sports athletes, just like baseball and football and basketball players do. Yeah, amen. Couldn't have said it better myself. This was fun, Sean. A uh, long time coming. I uh, was uh, kind of waiting for PFL Championship time of year to kind of to have you on. Uh, it's been great to catch up. It's, I'm so happy to see you thriving in this role and happy to see the PFL thriving in all aspects. Um, like I said, November 24th, Washington, D.C. I'll be watching. PFL Championships going down on Black Friday. Something for everyone. Uh, and like I said, thank you so much for coming on the show this week. Thanks for having me. Hopefully I uh, see you in person soon. Hope so too. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. It really means a lot to me. And hey, listen, if you enjoyed this episode, please go and give it a follow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows.